Hello, everyone. I'm Giuseppe from Evolution AI, and welcome to the London Machine Learning Meetup. Today, we have Noam Brown from Facebook AI Research, who's going to talk to us about AI for Imperfect Information Game, Poker and Beyond. The talk will be followed by a Q&A session that will be moderated by Michael Schuster from the Czech Technical University. So as usual, you can ask questions using the Q&A tool at the bottom. So please use the Q&A tool rather than the chat. Um, if you need any clarification, please do ask the question in real time and we'll try to answer it in real time. And at the end of the talk, there's going to be, a, as usual, a Q&A session where we'll review the, the questions and call for people to um, ask for the, uh, to ask them uh, in person. So if you would like to ask the question yourself, please raise your hand. Okay, if you need to speak to any of us for any issue, you can use the chat. And that's about it for me. So I'll go no one. No. We have some connection issues. Yeah, I'm back. Oh, you're back? OK. <laughs> Good. So yeah, whenever you're ready, you, you can start. OK, great. Uh, right. Can everybody Enjoy the talk. see my screen OK? Yep. OK, great. Uh, so yes, my name is Noam Brown. Uh, I'm a researcher at Facebook AI Research. And I'm going to talk about AI for imperfect information games, uh, poker, and beyond. OK, so to start with, this talk is going to focus on imperfect information games. And then when it comes to, uh, well, first of all, when I talk about games, I don't mean you know rec just recreational games like chess or, or poker. I also mean um, any sort of strategic interaction that involves multiple participants. Uh, for example, uh, financial markets, negotiations, security interactions, or even self-driving cars interacting with each other at a busy intersection. Now you can broadly categorize games in two categories, perfect information games or imperfect information games. Perfect information games are situations where all the players have perfect information about, about the state of the world. They both observe the same thing. Whereas in perfect information games, players have private knowledge. Now, uh, most real world strategic interactions involve some amount of hidden information. That said, a lot of the historical AI research has focused on perfect information games, um, such as chess and go. And uh, because these are simpler. And it was thought that by researching these uh, simpler domains, eventually the research would extend outwards to the, to the more complex real world settings. Um, but it turns out that hasn't really been the case. Um, now, when it comes to imperfect information games, the classic benchmark and challenge problem is poker. And in particular, a variant of poker known as No Limit Texas Hold'em. So No Limit Texas Hold'em is a longstanding challenge problem for AI and game theory. In fact, the original papers on uh, Nash Equilibria talked about poker as a uh, example of the work. Uh, it, no Limit Texas Hold'em in particular is a massive game. It uh, has 10 to the 161 different decision points in the two-player version, um, which is more than the number of atoms in the universe squared. And it's by far the most popular variant of poker in the world. So for example, here is a, a picture from uh, Casino Royale, which is a James Bond movie where they play No Limit Texas Hold'em poker. So, uh, there had been like a, an annual competition where people would play each other in this game, um, where different AI researchers would play, play their bots against each other. And so we saw gradual progress in, uh, in this domain. And eventually in 2017, my advisor and I uh, developed Libratus, which played against four of the world's best heads of No Limit Texas Hold'em poker pros and defeated them. Now, Libratus was trained entirely through self-play. There was no human data that went into the bot. And we played 120,000 hands over the course of 20 days in January, 2017. And there are $200,000 divided among the pros to incentivize them to play their best. And the bot won by an overwhelming margin, about four standard deviations of statistical significance. And one thing I really wanna point out here and emphasize is that the bot didn't just play five or 10 hands of poker, it played 120,000 hands over 20 days against a team of pros. And when I say a team, I mean that they were all working together to try to figure out how to explore the bot for weaknesses that they could exploit. So at the end of each day, we would give them a log of all the hands that were played, and they would go through those logs and see, okay, well, on this hand, the bot had, uh, uh, the bot had these cards, um, trying to figure out what the bot strategy is, um, coordinating who would explore what parts of the, 
uh, of the bot strategy to try to find weaknesses so that they wouldn't overlap their work. And what they found most surprising at the end of the competition is that even though we gave them this information about what the bot had on each of the hands, um, and even though they had all this ample time to try to find weaknesses in the bot strategy, they still weren't able to exploit it. And I think um, that's a testament to the game theory approach that we're, we've taken in this work of trying to minimize the exploitability in the bot. And I think that's a really important approach to take in real world settings as well, because if you, uh, for example, are a large company with millions or billions of users and you deploy a system in the real world, if there is a weakness in that system, then your users are going to find it and, and potentially exploit it, given enough time. Um, okay, so that was our 2017 bot that played two player poker. We followed this up in 2019 with Pluribus, which played six player poker. Six player poker, it, it could play, we could have made it play seven or five player poker as well, but we chose six player because six player is the most popular uh, form of no limit Texas Hold'em. Uh, so we played against 15 top professionals in six-player element Texas Hold'em. We played 10,000 hands over 12 days. We used a variance reduction technique to reduce the, the luck factor. Um, and the bot again won with statistical significance. And I think what's really significant about Pluribus is that even though the game was orders of magnitude uh, larger because we went from two-player to six-player, um, it was actually orders of magnitude cheaper to create Pluribus. It only costs under $150 to train, and it runs in real time on a 28-core CPU. And uh, the reason for this is because we use new search techniques that made it much cheaper uh, to, to run compared to, to compared to past techniques. And there's a question, how many days did it take to train Pluribus? Um, I think it was like we were trained it on a 64 core CPU in about seven or eight days. So I, again, like I think asking how many days did it take is, is the wrong measurement because, you know, you could train it on a single CPU core and then it would take a very long time or you could train it on like, you know, like AlphaGo style resources, in which case it would take like 30 minutes. Um, the, the real question is like how much computational, how many computational resources went into the training? And, and the answer is you could train this on AWS for about 150 bucks. So this is definitely within reach of the average user. Um, a lot of these same techniques now are being used to train professional poker players. Um, and I think what's really compelling about this is it shows the techniques that went into Pluribus and made this achievement possible uh, wasn't just a matter of waiting for hardware to catch up to the technology. Um, this kind of achievement would have been possible 20 years ago if the research had been there. Now, obviously, there was a huge amount of research that that we built upon, um, and and that research hadn't happened by you know 1990. Uh, but if the research was there 20 years ago, this this could have been possible even back then with those kinds of resources. Um, Okay, so there's a question about the techniques that Pluribus used to reduce the depth of the game tree. I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the talk. Okay, so uh, I first wanna start off by talking about what we're trying to, to approximate in these games. And what the answer is, we're trying to compute a Nash equilibrium. So a Nash equilibrium is a set of strategies in which no player can improve by deviating uh, from, their, from their strategy. And in two player zero sum games in particular, a Nash equilibrium ensures that you will not lose an expectation no matter what your opponent does. Um, and we're gonna measure something called exploitability, which is how much we would lose to a worst case adversary um, that's playing a best response to our strategy. Um, so to give you some intuition for this, let's say we're playing rock, paper, scissors. And let's say our strategy in rock, paper, scissors is to always throw rock. Well, in that case, our opponent could best respond to us by always throwing paper and our exploitability would be one because we're losing one point on average each turn. Okay, so let's say we're trying to switch things up a little bit. We throw rock on the first two rounds and then if our opponent throws paper on those two rounds, then we throw scissors. Well, in this case, our exploitability is still one because the best response to us is to throw paper on the first two rounds and then rock on the third round. Now, you might say this is unfair. Uh, we're kind of assuming that the opponent knows what we're going to do. And, and the answer is yes, that is what we're essentially assuming, that the, we assume that our strategy is common knowledge, our policy is common knowledge, that the opponent knows what our policy is. That said, we also assume that the opponent does not know the outcome of random processes. Um, so that means if we were to randomize our policy, then the opponent would not know uh, what the outcome of the policy would be. So if our policy is to throw rock 100% of the time on, on the first turn, then they know we're going to throw rock. But if we randomize equally between throwing rock, paper, and scissors, our policy is actually a mixed policy, uh, then they don't know uh, which one, which outcome will, will, 
come out. They only know the probabilities of the outcomes. Okay, so if we want to be unexploitable on rock, paper, scissors, the answer is to mix. If we mix equally between throwing rock, paper, and scissors on each of the three rounds, then there's no way for the opponent to best respond to, to exploit us. Um, anything they do will, an expectation tie, and our exploitability will be zero. Now, you might say that this is unfair, that we're, uh, oh, sorry, uh, you might say that, okay, well, we're not, we're not losing, we're not being exploitable, but we're also not, uh, we're not going to win an expectation if we take this uh, Nash equilibrium approach in rock, paper, scissors. And that's true. In rock, paper, scissors, if you play the Nash equilibrium, you will always tie an expectation. Um, and, but that said, in poker, uh, it's a much more complicated game. And even figuring out what actions should be played with positive probability is highly non-trivial. Uh, and so if you play the Nash equilibrium in poker, you will probably end up winning an expectation because your opponent will make mistakes. And in fact, this is a very common recommendation for professional poker players. In fact, there was a poker strategy guide I saw recently that said, poker is simple, as your opponents make mistakes, you profit. Um, so this is the approach that we took uh, in Libratus and Pluribus and our, our line of research um, of just trying to approximate the Nash equilibrium, play that strategy, which guarantees that you will not lose an expectation. And in practice, we end up winning an expectation because our opponent may, chooses suboptimal actions that are not part of the Nash equilibrium. Now, it is true that you, you could do substantially better against a weaker player if you were able to exploit their weaknesses. Uh, so Libratus and Pluribus, while they're going to beat anybody in, in uh, No Limit Texas Hold'em, um, they might not beat a weak player as severely as a professional poker player might that might adjust to the weaknesses of, of the weak player. Um, and this is a very interesting line of research. Uh, it's one that um, a lot of people in the field have pursued, uh, but it's been so far pretty unsuccessful. Uh, and there's, there's two reasons for this. One is that anytime you try to exploit weaknesses in your opponent, you're opening yourself up for exploitation as well. So let's say you, uh, your opponent throws rock for four times in a row. If you assume that they throw paper, that they're going to throw paper on the fifth time and you throw, throw paper uh, to counter them, um, if, if, if you assume they're going to throw rock on the fifth round and you throw, and you throw paper to counter them, well, maybe they're trying to trick you and they, they actually throw scissors on the fifth round. So you're opening yourself up to exploitation if you try to exploit them uh, because you never know for sure. And the other challenge is that um, in general, AI techniques are very sample and efficient. Uh, so humans are really good at adapting given a small number of samples. And if you want to exploit your opponent in a game like poker, you have to be able to adjust on the fly very quickly given a small amount of data. Uh, so that's, that's a, a challenge in AI in general, and it's a challenge for um, these kind of bots to be able to exploit an opponent over a short period of time. So this is not the uh, research approach that we took. Uh, it is a valid research approach, and I think it's still a very interesting and unanswered question uh, in AI. Okay. Um, so what about outside of two-player zero-sum games? Well, outside of two-player zero-sum games, there's a lot of problems with Nash equilibria. Uh, for one, Nash equilibria cannot be computed in polynomial time in general. Um, and even if they could be computed efficiently, it might not make sense to play them. It doesn't guarantee anymore that you're not going to lose an expectation if you're not in a two-player zero-sum game. Now, that said, the algorithms still work well in practice in many large games. Uh, for example, we took the same approach um, in six-player poker, and that did extremely well, beat be professional, top professional poker players. Uh, and we've also shown recently in a, a paper we just presented at iClear that you can take this uh, a similar approach, run it in a game called uh, Diplomacy, and also achieve very strong performance. And what's interesting about Diplomacy is that it's not just an adversarial game. There's actually a lot of cooperation in the game as well. So these techniques are actually uh, quite general. Uh, and of course, I won't claim that they're the answer to all, all games, uh, but uh, certainly these techniques do extend beyond just two players or some games. Okay, so now I want to talk about um, how we go about developing bots for these kinds of games and computing these, these Nash equilibria and two-player zero sum games. And the first technique that I want to introduce is counterfactual regret minimization. So before I get to CFR, I want to talk a bit about um, how we solve perfect information games. So in a perfect information game, a perfect information extensive form game, we have uh, a tree structure. If you think about games like chess and go, uh, moves are done sequentially, the games form a tree, 
And here is an example game where um, player one acts, then player two acts, and then player one acts, player one might act again. And eventually there's a terminal state that's reached and a reward is given to each player. So here the first number is the reward for player one, and the second number is the reward for player two. Now in a two-player zero-sum game, all of these uh, terminal values will sum to zero. But here I'm just showing it, for example, in a general sum game. So if we want to solve this game, uh, we can do minimax search. So we travel to the bottom of the tree. Let's we assume, okay, what would we do? What would player one do if they got to this state? Uh, and the answer is, well, player one could go left and they can get a payoff of one. Whereas if they go right, they get a payoff of zero. So clearly they would go left and get that payoff of one. So now we replace that player one state with a payoff of one zero because we know if player one got to there, they would choose left. So now we go up the game tree. We do the same reasoning for player two. What would they do if they got to this state? Well, if they went left, then they would end up getting a payoff of zero because player one would go left again. If they go right, then they get a payoff of two. So clearly they're going to go right. And we replace that state with the, uh, the payoff for going right. And we do this all the way up the game tree. And eventually uh, with this approach, we can find the optimal path for the players. Uh, we know that player one will go right and player two will go right. Um, and that's the, the Nash equilibrium for this game. OK, so what about imperfect information games? Can we take the same approach? Well, the answer is no. Um, in imperfect information games, again, there's hidden information. And so here I'm showing an example imperfect information game where there's a dotted line between the two player two nodes. And this means that player two does not know which of those two states they are in. They just know that they are in one of those two states. Uh, and that is called an information state or info state. Now, a player's policy, a player's uh, strategy must be the same for all the states in an info state. Because obviously, if a player doesn't know which of the two states they're in, then their policy can't be different for those two states. OK, so what happens if we try to do backward induction or minimax search in, in this game? Well, let's say we get to the bottom of the game tree. Well, clearly, player one is going to go left, and there's a payoff of 1, 0. OK, so now let's go up one level. What does player two do in this state? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends on uh, with the probability that player two is in each of those nodes. But the problem is that the probability that the player two is in one of those nodes, each of those nodes depends on what player one's policy is farther up the game tree. Uh, but what player one's policy is farther up the game tree depends on what player two's policy is at this information state. So we can't just do this, uh, this backward induction if there are information states involved. And that's why um, minimax search doesn't work um, in imperfect information games, at least as it's done in perfect information games. Um, OK, Michal, is there uh, any questions that I should be answering now, or should I just continue? Um, uh, yes, so uh, there was a question about uh, games uh, that have uh, so I will just read out the question. Are there, are there any games where it was shown that uh, multiplayer equilibria uh, consistently converge to bad strategies or uh, that uh, don't converge at all? Um, yeah, so certainly there are games like the repeated prisoner's dilemma um, where you have to cooperate over a long period of time and there's different Nash equilibria. And if you just run these regret minimization techniques, they tend to converge to the non-cooperative equilibrium. Um, and there are there are certainly examples where where if you run regret minimization, counterfactual regret minimization, these, this kind of technique that I'll introduce, um, it will not converge to an Nash equilibrium. Whether or not it's bad is very interpretive. So um, so that that's like a very open question in in game theory research. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question is uh, uh, back about uh, pluribus. So uh, how does a minimally exploitable strategy compare to an optimal expectation strategy? Is pluribus's win always marginal? Uh, what we found empirically is that uh, pluribus's win is not always marginal. It actually wins by a very large margin if you play the Nash equilibrium. Um, this might be something about the nature of poker. I mean, certainly you could imagine very complex games um, where you know, like I said, in poker, it's very, it's actually quite difficult to determine what actions you should be playing with positive probability at all. Um, and so in rock, paper, scissors, it's really easy because all the actions you should be playing with some probability. Whereas in poker, um, it's actually very difficult to determine what you should be doing with any probability. Um, and so you can imagine very complicated games where um, all of the actions should be played with some probability, 
but it's just all about getting the, the, the proportions right. And in that case, in those kinds of games, it would be much more focused on exploiting your opponent's weaknesses. Um, poker appears to be not one of those games. And I think a lot of real world situations fall into this category of um, you, you, you would do really well just by playing the equilibrium. Um, but you know, it's certainly not the answer to, uh, to these games completely. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to, uh, to CFR. So I just said minimax search does not work in imperfect information games. So what can we do? Uh, the answer is this algorithm called counterfactual regret minimization. And I will introduce the Monte Carlo version of this algorithm. So MCCFR is an iterative algorithm that will gradually converge to a Nash equilibrium in two players' zero-sum games. Um, and the way it works is we will uh, traverse the game tree for player one, and then we'll go traverse the game tree for player two, and then we'll go back to player one and so on. And we're going to maintain a regret value for every action in every state of the game. And all these regret values start at zero. So when we traverse the game tree for player one, we're going to pick actions in proportion to the amount of positive regret on those actions. Now, all the regrets start at zero. So at the beginning, player one picks an action uniformly randomly. So let's say player one randomly chooses to go left. We might encounter a player two node. We again pick actions proportional to the amount of positive regret, which in this case, they're all zero. Uh, so let's say we go left again. Uh, we encounter another player one node. Again, we're going to pick randomly for now. And eventually, we receive some reward. Uh, let's say it's $50. So now player one is going to investigate all the other actions that they could have taken in that state uh, and see hypothetically what the reward would have been. So player one could have gone right here. And they can see that they would have received a reward of $100 if they had gone right. And so the regret is going to increase by the difference between what they could have gotten for that action versus what they actually received. So they could have gotten $100. They actually got $50. So the regret goes up by 50. And we're able to obtain these hypothetical rewards because player one is playing against the copy of itself. Uh, so player one sees if it had gone right, then player two would have done this, and then player one would have done this, and eventually um, it would have ended up with $100. Um, and I would argue that this is very similar to how humans learn to play a game like poker. If you've ever played poker before, it's really common for a person to ask, um, what would you have done if I had chosen this other action instead? If I had raised, would you have called me? So it's that kind of counterfactual reasoning uh, that the bot is doing um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this algorithm as well. So after we uh, investigate the other hypothetical actions in the bottom state, player one is going to pass up the reward that they actually received. So they're going to pass up that reward of $50. We're going to skip the player two node because we're only updating the regrets for player one on this traversal. And then again, player one is going to uh, explore all the other actions they could have taken. So player one explores what would happen if I had gone right. Maybe they would have encountered another player one node. In that case, in that state, they would have gone left and received a reward of minus $500. Um, now they could have alternatively gone right and would have received a reward of $100. So the regret for that right action goes up by 600. Um, now player one is gonna pass up that reward of minus $500 because if at the root node player one had gone right, then they would have ended up going left next. So the hypothetical reward for that topmost right action is minus 500. And the regret for that action becomes minus 550. And I should clarify all these states that we're encountering. When I say state, I mean info state in this case. So player one is encountering different info states and the regrets are maintained for all the info states, not just for um, the individual states within the info state. Okay, so on the next traversal, player one would pick actions in proportion to the amount of positive regret on those actions. Um, so we would go to player two next, they would update, player two would update their regrets, then we go back to player one, and player one would do the same exact thing, but picking actions proportional to regret. And if you do this, then as the number of iterations goes to infinity, um, you will converge to a Nash equilibrium. The average strategy played over all the iterations will converge to a Nash equilibrium. Now, counterfactual regret minimization, the non-Monte Carlo version, is exactly what I described, except you take the expected value over all the actions rather than sample. And um, the average, you converge to the average, uh, the average strategy converges to a Nash equilibrium at a rate of roughly one over epsilon squared, where epsilon is uh, how close you are to the Nash equilibrium. 
Now that's the theoretical bound. In practice, you can get the algorithm to converge much faster than that with some small tweaks. So for example, CFR is a mod CFR plus is a modification of CFR, where after each iteration, if the regret is less than zero, you simply set it to zero. So you floor the regret at zero. And when you compute the average strategy, you weigh iteration T by T. And this small change surprisingly makes uh, CFR converge orders of magnitude faster. Um, it's still unclear why that's the case. And in fact, the theoretical bound does not improve, uh, but the empirical performance improves by a lot. Now, um, a lot of my PhD research was focused on improving CFR. And one of the things we did um, to improve it even further is introduce linear CFR and discounted CFR. Um, so these are variants of CFR where you discount earlier iterations. Um, so for example, on the first iteration of CFR, you're picking actions randomly, which is obviously not a good strategy. And that random policy is being averaged into the average strategy. So by discounting earlier iterations, you're able to get rid of these early bad iterations faster and focus on the good later iterations. And empirically, we show that this speeds up convergence by about a factor of three to 10 over CFR plus. Um, and also this works well with, with uh, sampling where CFR plus isn't compatible with sampling. And it maintains the theoretical convergence bounds as well. And this, uh, so this improves CFR by a lot. So for example, on the left here, um, I'm showing in rock, paper, scissors, the convergence of regular vanilla CFR. And you can see it's converging to um, the average policy of one third for all the actions, but it's taking a very long time to do it. On the right here, we use linear CFR and it converges much, much faster. Okay, so this is the algorithm that you wanna use if you're trying to approximate a Nash equilibrium um, in, in a large imperfect information game. Uh, there's a lot of alternatives that you could use as well, but this is, CFR is the one that empirically performs the best and it's uh, widely used today for this purpose. Now that said, what I've described is the tabular form of CFR. I, I said that you have to maintain a regret value for every info state in the game. And if you have a very large game like No Limit Texas Hold'em Poker, then the number of info states is you know, around 10 to the 161. So clearly that's gonna be intractable. Okay, so what do we do? Well, I'll now talk about how to extend CFR to extremely large games. Now for years, the, uh, the state-of-the-art approach for this was called abstraction. And the idea of abstraction is that you have this extremely large original game and that's way too large to solve in its entirety. So we're going to bucket together similar states, info states, and have a smaller abstract game that we then solve um, using these CFR techniques. So for example, you might say that having a four diamonds ace of spades is very similar to having a five of diamonds ace of spades. And so we will bucket those two states together, treat them identically, and now have regret values for that bucket instead of both of those states. And so this, by bucketing those two states together, you cut down the amount of uh, regret that you need to store by a factor of two. And of course you can do this in a, a much larger scale. You can bucket together thousands or millions of different states and reduce the uh, complexity by, by a lot. And this actually worked quite well. And it's what we did in Labratus and Pluribus. Um, that said, it required very extensive domain knowledge. Uh, in fact, there were several papers, about a half dozen papers um, that were written just on how to do abstraction in the domain of poker. And so that makes it very difficult to extend to other games. So my colleagues and I um, in, recently introduced Deep CFR and Dream. Uh, so these are Deep CFR replaces abstraction with a neural network approximation of regrets. So instead of maintaining regrets in a tabular way for all the different states you could be in, um, you instead, when you're collecting information about what regrets are, you uh, feed those samples into a neural network and train uh, a, a network to predict what the regrets are for different states. And so now when you encounter a novel state, you can you know, use the network to generalize between similar states and, and estimate what the regrets are for this novel state. Now, deep CFR and um, its follow-ups, so there have been uh, several follow-ups uh, uh, recently, including DREAM, which is model-free, but also um, uh, uh, techniques from other research labs as well. Um, it requires far less domain knowledge. That said, it doesn't perform quite as well as abstraction in poker, um, but you know, this is the classic trade-off. It's, it's more expensive, it requires, um, it, it's more expensive, it's uh, a little worse on performance, but it requires far less domain knowledge, and that's the, the general trade-off of uh, deep neural networks in, in general when it comes to reinforcement learning. Now, 
the nice thing about deep CFR is that it makes it possible, it, it will hopefully make it possible to extend these CFR techniques to uh, much more complex domains um, and potentially in the future, even 3D environments. So these techniques are not there yet. Um, they're still being uh, deployed and tested in relatively small scale, um, you know, tabular, uh, not wouldn't say tabular games, but, um, you know, discrete games like poker or, um, or liar's dice, these kinds of games. Um, but I think that this general line of research is accelerating very quickly. And I, I do think that within the next few years, we'll start to see these kinds of techniques being deployed um, in things like 3D environments and continuous environments. Um, there is a question. So uh, about uh, the neural network, uh, how did you train uh, CART embeddings? Uh, and when did you know that the embeddings are useful? Or was it a uh, one E to E pipeline? I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. So um, I actually don't really know the answer to that question. So my, my collaborators handled a lot of the, the neural network uh, embedding, uh, embedding stuff. Uh, I was uh, handling the, the CFR side of the, uh, of the research. Uh, so unfortunately, I, I, you'll have to take a look at the paper for that answer. OK, so now I want to talk about uh, search. So at this point, we have an approximate Nash equilibrium, uh, but it's a, a very approximate Nash equilibrium. Um, and what we want to do is instead of just using our neural network to you know, get a policy for a state, we want to spend some time to think in real time and try to compute a better policy. Um, and the first thing that I want to argue is that search is extremely important. Um, here is uh, a figure from the AlphaGo Zero paper. And on the x-axis, we have different versions of AlphaGo. And on the y-axis, we have ELO rating, which is a way of comparing performance between different agents. And you can see um, superhuman performance is around 3,600 ELO. AlphaGo Lee, which is the version of AlphaGo that played against Lucid all, is just a bit over that line. Um, AlphaGo Zero, which uh, was at the time the, the strongest follow-up to AlphaGo, um, has an ELO rating of over 5,000, so it's clearly superhuman. But if you take out the Monte Carlo tree search from AlphaGo Zero, the ELO rating drops to around 3,000, which is far below the, the top human level. And this is just if you take away the search algorithm, Monte Carlo tree search, that was used at test time. I'm not even talking about taking it away during training time. Uh, if you were to take it away during training time, it would drop way lower as well. And, and so I think what this goes to show is that search really is critical for achieving top human performance uh, in, in Go. In fact, there, there has not been any Go AI uh, that has been developed uh, that has reached the superhuman level without using uh, Monte Carlo tree search or some form of search um, in training time or test time. And this is a pattern that's not unique to Go. Um, in fact, if you look at pretty much all of the game AI breakthroughs that have happened over the last several decades, they have all involved some form of search. So for example, TD Gammon and Backgammon um, used two-ply search. Um, Deep Blue used alpha beta pruning. Um, all the versions of Go used Monte Carlo tree search. And poker also as well, the key breakthrough that enabled top human performance in, in poker was search. And we've even seen this with later um, game AI results. So for example, with Hanabi, my collaborators and I developed a superhuman bot for self-play Hanabi. Um, and what made that possible was using the search techniques that we used in poker and, and applying it to Hanabi. Um, this is a, a cooperative card game. Uh, and also in diplomacy as well, uh, we haven't reached superhuman performance in diplomacy, but we've, uh, we showed with uh, we could reach very strong performance in, in the no press version of diplomacy where players cannot communicate uh, much stronger than previous bots by using search. And so I think this is a very general result. And I think it's something that's underappreciated in the AI community and especially the machine learning community. I, I see a lot of papers that point to AlphaGo as um, you know, one of the classic achievements of deep reinforcement learning. But I think it's important to remember that deep that uh, Deep learning was only the last piece that was added to, to AlphaGo. Um, Monte Carlo tree search is, I think, just as important um, a reason for its success as the deep RL part. OK, so let's talk a bit about how search works. Uh, and I'll start with, with perfect information games. So to start with, um, 
I want to talk about what a state is. So a state is, uh, it must be a, what's called a sufficient statistic. That is, it must contain all of the information that's necessary to determine the optimal next move. Now, in chess and Go, we commonly think of the board, the board configuration as the state. Uh, but in fact, that might not be enough. For example, in Go, there is the co rule. And so you need to like, actually track the last few board states, board configurations, to, to know what are legal moves. Um, and chess as well, um, in order to determine what the, uh, what the optimal strategy is, you have to keep track of the last several board states. Because for example, if you repeat the same board state three times in a row, um, or, or three times, then it is an automatic draw. So in the worst case, um, a state in a perfect information game is the entire sequence of actions that have occurred so far. And what uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I wanna say that understanding what the state is in a game can actually be quite complicated and quite difficult. And we see that in a game like poker, having a good understanding of what the state is um, is actually uh, quite complicated. Okay, so that is a, a state. It's a sufficient statistic that allows us to determine uh, the optimal next move uh, with the information that we have. So instead of keeping track of the entire sequence of actions that have occurred in the game so far, we only have to keep track of like, let's say the last three board configurations and we can use that as, as the state to determine the optimal next move. Now a state value function, uh, takes as input a state and outputs the unique value of both players playing optimally from that point forward. Uh, so for example, if given this board configuration uh, here, it doesn't matter what the last few moves were. Um, if we plug this into a neural network and say it's white's move to act, what, what's, the, uh, what's the value to player white in this situation? Well, we can see that white can take the black bishop and that's checkmate. And so the value for this state is one. Now there's a question of where do these state value networks come from? And there's a few options. So one is that they could be a handcrafted heuristic. Um, another is that they could be learned by training on expert human games, or it could be learned through self-play reinforcement learning, which is what was done in Alpha Zero. Now, the high-level intuition for, for search is that in theory, you don't need it. In theory, you could solve the entire game of chess, for example, by using backward induction. But because the game is so deep and so long, um, this would not be tractable. And so what chess AIs do instead is they look about five moves ahead and they stop there and estimate the value of those states using their value network. And then they do backward induction um, using those state values. So they solve a much smaller mini game, a sub game um, with the values uh, of the, the, with the value network for states at the leaf node. And if the state value network is perfect, then this will compute the optimal next move. Okay, so this sounds great for games like chess and Go, um, but why is search so difficult in imperfect information games? And the answer is because states as traditionally defined don't have well-defined values. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So this is the game Rock, Paper, Scissors Plus. It is just like Rock, Paper, Scissors, except if either player throws scissors, then the winner receives two points and the loser loses two points. And this is just to break the symmetry of the game. And I was showing um, a sequential version of this game where player one acts first and then player two acts. So that's why there's these dotted lines between the player two nodes. And the Nash equilibrium in this game is for player is for both players to throw rock and paper with 40% probability and scissors with 20% probability. And if both players do that, then in expectation, they both receive a value of zero. Okay, so let's say we're doing a depleted form of search in this game. Uh, so player one is going to look one move ahead, stop there, and then substitute um, a value estimate of both players playing the Nash equilibrium, which in this case results in a value of zero. This is what that depth limited subgame would look like. And you can see that if player one were to solve this depth limited subgame, they would not arrive at the Nash equilibrium strategy of throwing rock and paper with 40% probability and scissors with 20% probability. They might throw they might end up with one third, one third, one third, or always throwing rock but there's not enough information to arrive at the Nash equilibrium of 40% of, uh, 40, 40 rock, 40% paper, 20% scissors. And the reason is because we're assuming that player two is going to play the Nash equilibrium no matter what player one does. And indeed, if that were true, if player two's strategy was fixed at playing the Nash equilibrium, then player one could throw rock with 100% probability and receive an expected value of zero. But in actuality, that's not what would happen. 
if player one were to, for example, throw a rock with 80% probability, then player two's policy would shift to always throwing paper, and the value of rock would decrease to be minus one. And again, this is uh, going back to our, our assumption I mentioned earlier, which is that the opponent knows what our policy is, even if they don't know the outcome of random processes. Player two knows that player one's policy is to throw rock with 80% probability. And so they, because they know that policy, they switch to this policy of always throwing paper. Okay, so how do we do search in uh, imperfect information game if uh, we can't use you know, these, these kinds of values, uh, state values? Well, one solution is to define an imperfect information game uh, state as a probability distribution over the different action observation history, so the different info states. And so what this means is that the value of player one throwing rock is not well defined in, uh, in an imperfect information game. But the value of player one throwing rock with 80% probability, paper with 10% probability, and scissors with 10% probability, that value is well defined, and that value is negative 0.6. Because in that case, player two's policy would be to always throw paper, and, um, and the resulting expected value is negative 0 0.6 to player one. Now, this is, I think, the really key result to, uh, to understand. Um, by the way, I should, I should say, this is not how we did search in, in Libratus and Pluribus. Uh, we used a different depth-limited search technique in, in Pluribus. And unfortunately, I would love to cover both, but um, you know, there's time constraints. And so I, what I'm talking about here is uh, more recent work on how to do search in imperfect information games. Um, this has been used in the past in the deck POM DP community, the decentralized um, cooperative games community. Uh, it was also used in the poker AI deep stack. Um, and uh, more recently, we've used it and shown how to train these values from scratch in the poker AI uh, rebel. So this is the key result to understand. The value of player one throwing rock that alone is not a well-defined value because it depends on the policy. It depends on the probability that player one threw rock. Um, but if you condition the value and say, okay, I want the value of throwing rock with 80% probability, paper with 10% probability, and scissors with 10% probability, that value is well-defined. Now, in more complex games, you need the probabilities over uh, action observation histories um, with, uh, for both players, not just for one player. Um, okay, so- There is a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so the question is, uh, you uh, denoted a v of rock is not well defined. Shouldn't it be v of uh, one rock, zero paper, zero scissors? Yeah. So I'm saying here that I mean, certainly the value of throwing rock 100% is well defined. But just saying, well, what's the value uh, of 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 rock if player one threw rock? Well, it depends on the probability that player one would throw rock because the probability that player one would throw rock determines what player two's policy is. Um, so, you know, if player one threw rock, but they only throw that with 1% probability, then player two isn't gonna throw, isn't gonna be throwing paper. And so the value of rock will actually be higher. And so this is a, it's a bit counterintuitive, but it's actually quite important to understand that because player two's policy is dependent on what player one's policy is, the value of an action for player one is dependent on the probability of that action. And this is, again, very different from perfect information games where a lot of our intuition comes from. The value of an action in chess doesn't depend on the probability it is chosen. But in an imperfect information game, the value of an action does depend on the probability it's chosen. For example, bluffing in poker, if you do it very rarely, it has a very high expected value. But if you always do it, then the opponent is going to know that you're, you're bluffing and, and so it would actually have a very negative value. Uh, is there a limit on the number of uh, probabilities that you need to consider in uh, imperfect information games? Or uh, like, is it all, all of the possible probabilities or can, can, you, can you do something smaller? Yeah, so um, you don't need all the policy, you don't need all the probabilities in the entire game. You just need the probabilities for the, um, the action observation histories or the info states that, that are consistent with uh, the game state. So I, I think uh, I'll get to that in the next slide. I think it will make more sense in, in a game like poker. So to, to elaborate on this more, here's a, a, a simple poker game. Uh, we have the discrete representation, uh, which is uh, the classic version of poker. So if each player is dealt a card, um, the player with a higher card wins, but their, their cards are private. So the players don't see what the other players' cards are. So the red player would look at what their card is, see that they have an ace, and then they say, I bet and then player, the blue player would act. 
Now we can think of this in a different way, which is the belief representation of the game. And uh, in this representation of the game, neither player sees what their private card is. Instead, there's a referee who uh, observes the private cards of each player. And when it's Red's turn to act, they announce publicly what they would do with every single one of their cards uh, if they have that card. So the red player says, if I have a two, then I bet with 50% probability. If I have a three, then I fold. If I have an ace, then I bet. And then after hearing this policy, the referee will announce, will look and see what the red player's card is and then announce what they did. So in this case, player, uh, since the red player said, if they have an ace, they bet with 100% probability, then the referee says player one bets. And now when this happens, both players can update their beliefs about what card uh, the red player has. Uh, so for example, the red player said, if I have a three, then I fold with 100% probability. And so both players now know that the red player does not have a three. And what's really important to understand here is that these two games, the Nash equilibrium in the belief representation of the game is also a Nash equilibrium in the discrete representation. And this is a very counterintuitive idea, but it really gets to the, to the crux of the uh, latest research that's going on uh, in this space. Uh, and this is, this is, for example, the approach that we take in, in, the, uh, in re the rebel algorithm. Um, now, you might say that isn't the red player giving up more information in the belief representation than in the discrete representation, because after all, they're announcing what the policy would be for every one of their cards. Um, whereas in the discrete representation, they're only saying what they would do with that single card. Um, and the answer is no, because again, we make, we make the assumption that blue knows what red's policy is, uh, that the opponent knows what our policy is. And so even though in the discrete representation, the red player is saying, I, I bet, well, the blue player knows what hands they would be betting with and what hands they would not be betting with. And so they don't have any extra information in the belief representation than they do in the discrete representation. Now, the other key thing to understand here is that the belief representation is a perfect information game, whereas the discrete representation is an imperfect information game. No player, the red player and the blue player don't have any private information in the belief representation. The referee has all the private information, but the referee is simply uh, a part of the game. Uh, it's no different than in backgammon, for example, um, uh, you know, a die roll, the outcome of a die roll is hidden information, but because neither player knows it ahead of time, uh, it's not considered an imperfect information game. And so what we've done here is taken an imperfect information game like poker and converted it into a perfect information game. Um, okay, so I'll, okay, I'll skip a little, I'll skip a little ahead because uh, I want to get to questions. Um, yeah, so the main idea here is that we have the, uh, in this, in this perfect information version of the game, the state is the probability over all the different cards that both players could be having, could hold. And an action is when a player announces what they would do with each one of their cards. And so um, the, the important thing to understand here is that the belief, the, the, the states and the actions are both continuous. They exist in a continuous uh, state space and a continuous action space. And this is different from a game like poker, uh, from, a, from a game like chess or go, where the state space and action space are discrete. So this is one of the major challenges of going from perfect information games to imperfect information games. That said, we introduced uh, this paper recently called Rebel, which shows that we can have an algorithm a lot like AlphaZero and run it on these continuous, uh, continuous uh, games. Uh, so imperfect information games that are converted into continuous perfect information games. Uh, AlphaZero can't deal with the continuous state and action space, but Rebel can. Um, and I would love to elaborate on this more, but again, we're, we're running short on time. Okay, so what's next? Uh, again, I'll run through this pretty quickly. So one of the challenges is that the input to rebel state value function is uh, dependent on the number of dimensions of the hidden information. And in Texas Hold'em, that's relatively small. The number of dimensions is about uh, 2,000, 2,500. Um, but you could have games with much higher amounts of hidden information. In that case, it's not clear how to extend these kinds of techniques to dealing with that amount of hidden information. Uh, another challenge is, you know, I said that Rebel is a lot like Alpha Zero in the sense that it can um, it, it can play games like like poker. Um, but there's a follow up recently to Alpha Zero called Mu Zero, which allows people allows the algorithm to play games even without a simulator. Uh, 
Um, and it remains an open question how to extend view zero to be able to deal with hidden information, uh, imperfect information games. And finally, I think the most important next step is going beyond two player zero sum games. So AIs are still bad at cooperation, negotiation, and coalition formation. Uh, and what's really interesting is that once you go beyond two player zero sum games or fully cooperative games, self play is not enough. Given infinite time and resources, a self play chess bot will eventually learn the Sicilian defense. But given an infinite time and resources, a self-play negotiation bot will not learn to speak English. So this is, I think, the biggest open question in uh, AI and game theory when it comes to when it comes to games. Okay, so I'll stop there and I'll take questions with the remaining time. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much for the very interesting talk, Noam. So yeah, Michael is going to keep uh, moderating the questions. So if anyone has any questions, please post them in the Q&A form and uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask it yourself. Okay, so we're having uh, questions coming in. So uh, Elko says, this was an amazing talk. Thank you. Uh, do you enjoy poker less now that you know the Nash equilibrium is so good? Um, I mean, I think this is definitely one of the appeals of poker. It was a very mystical game that you, kn you knew there was this Nash equilibrium strategy and nobody could really understand. Uh, nobody really knew what it was, but if you, if you can approximate it, then you, you basically print money. Um, and now that we understand it, 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 it does, I think, for me, detract from the game a little bit, um, but I think the uh, the exploitation part, at least in live poker, is still a very important part of the game, and that's that's still an unanswered question. So when I play it, that's the part that I focus on. Uh, Tadas asks, uh, could you elaborate on the techniques that Pluribus used to reduce the depth of the tree? Yeah, so I would have loved to talk about that in more detail. Um, the the short answer is that. You know, having a neural network that takes as inputs the probability distribution where states you could be in is very expensive. And so what Pluribus did instead um, is that it's, it's, it did something closer to like what, what chess AIs do, where there's a, um, you know, you don't plug in all the different states you could be in. Um, it only plugs in one state, but it accounts for the fact that there are different policies that can be played after that state. Uh, and so it essentially like gives each player one final choice of what policy they want to play for the remainder of the game. And by giving each player that choice, Pluribus understands to be robust to different options. So you can imagine, for example, on rock, paper, scissors, if you're always assuming that the opponent is going to play the Nash equilibrium, then you could be like, well, I'll just always throw rock and they're not going to be able to, to counter me. But if you give the opponent the choice of playing a few different policies, um, then you understand that if you always throw rock, then the opponent could switch to a different policy that would exploit you. And so by having a small number of, uh, of, uh, of policies that you consider, you understand to be robust to those policies. And that's, that's the kind of search that Pluribus did. Uh, Hugo asks, uh, what kind of hardware was requ required to run Pluribus in real time? Um, it was about 28 core CPU, uh, no GPUs. Uh, Alberto asks, uh, did you ever consider to apply ISMCTS or information set Monte Carlo tree search to perform search? If no, why? So I, I'm strongly opposed to ISMCTS. Um, I think it is a heuristic that works well in some games like hearts where there's the hidden information isn't super important, uh, but it is not theoretically sound. And um, I don't know if anybody's tried it in poker, but I don't think it would work if they did. Um, in games, yeah, in games where the hidden information is very important, there's no reason to think that ISMCTS uh, would actually work. Uh, MC Castell asks, uh, to use your final example of learning English, currently we use models like BERT or GPT-3 to learn from large amounts of text, but this learning does not take the form of an interactive experience which might be more analogous to how humans learn. How might these techniques be used to develop new forms of language uh, 
sorry, uh, new forms of language learning in NLP? Oh, that's, I mean, that's a good question. And I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. I've, I don't have much experience with NLP. Um, I mean, I do think that the, the search techniques that we use in, in game AI is, is extremely powerful. And um, I do think that it has potential to be used in, in other forms of AI as well. Uh, so I think that's the thing that I would, I mean, if I was to, to work on NLP, that's the thing that I would try to carry over um, this, this like focus on, on search. Um, but I don't think I could comment on, on it much more than that. Uh, what uh, Tadas asks, uh, what good sources or papers uh, uh, you would recommend to look up to understand pluribus tree depth reduction? Is the original paper enough? Any preceding research that's uh, worth looking up? Yeah, so if you want to understand the search technique that was used in Pluribus, I would look at the Pluribus paper, and then I would also look at, um, there was a preceding paper from NeurIPS in 2018 uh, with my collaborators and I, we developed a bot called Modicum, and uh, that that was really the, the same idea for the search algorithm. Um, and so that goes into more detail about, about the search technique. Mm. Uh, Wei Chi asks a number of questions, um, but I think I will pick uh, some of them. <laughs> how how I, I was it? Uh, wants, uh, sorry, Mike. Uh, I think she wants to ask the, yeah. the, uh, that they want to ask the question themselves. So we, we can unmute them. OK, yeah, sure. Yep. Yeah, Wei, you should be able to speak. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you're very quiet, but yeah. OK. Um... Yeah, well, I'll try to speak a bit louder. Well, thank you, first of all, it was very interesting. Um, so my first question is, in the red versus blue scenario, I was just wondering that even if red would not announce his strategy to blue, it would still be the same because blue would know that red would be incentivized to play the best possible strategy, right? Even if red would not announce his strategy to blue, it would still be the same uh, because blue knows that red isn't. Um, Sorry, uh, I have to, I have to go back a little bit and look at look at that slide. So you're saying even if red, I talking about the discrete representation or the belief representation? I, I, I'm just saying that I would think that the, both representations would ultimately be the same, even if yeah, that, that's the intuition. Yeah, yes, they are they are both the same because um, because blue knows red's policy. Right, but even even if red wouldn't announce it, right? Oh, uh, well, let's see what you're saying. Um, well, there could be multiple. Nash equilibria, uh, which might result in like multiple optimal policies. And even if red didn't announce it, uh, blue might not know which one red was playing. Oh, that's really interesting. I haven't thought about multiple Nash equilibria. Okay, the second question was, uh, how fast were pluribus decisions? Uh, I think it varied. For pluribus, it, it was like basically instantaneous on the preflop. Um, and then I think um, on the flop, it was like 20 seconds. On the Turner River, it was more like five or 10. Cool. And then now a bit um, a lighter question. How was it like fighting the temptation to unleash purpose in online mm -hmm. games? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I don't think there's as much money in, in running these poker bots online as, as people think. I mean, maybe like 10 years ago, at the real the height of the poker boom, there would have been a lot of money in it. Um, but the poker sites, they use a lot of sophisticated techniques to try to combat, um, you know, people using bots on these sites. And, and so, you know, Facebook pays me enough that it's not worth it. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Um, lastly, are you still working on improving purpose or still in poker in general? So my research is now uh, focused on generality, which is trying to, um, to instead of just focusing on poker, trying to get these techniques to play multiple games. And, and we've had some success with that with Rebel. Uh, Rebel is able to play both poker and Liar's Dice, and in theory could play other games as well. Uh, we haven't tried it. And um, we actually open sourced the code for, for Rebel um, for the game of Liar's Dice, which is another imperfect information game that's kind of like poker. Uh, and I'm also focused on the question of going beyond two players, zero some games. Uh, so I think both of those directions are really interesting, but not focusing on poker so much anymore. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. That was very fascinating. Uh, Elko asks, uh, if I understand correctly, the game state in the belief format includes the policy of your opponent as part of the game state. How is that encoded in the game state practically? So um, to clarify, we don't encode the policy of the opponent in the game state. Um, you could in theory do that, but uh, it would be very expensive. And so that's going back to the sufficient statistic thing. 
um, that, you know, just like in chess, you could encode the entire sequence of actions that were played, and that would be a representation of, that would be a legitimate representation of the game state. Um, you don't want to do that because it's so expensive. And so what we do instead is this sufficient statistic that just keeps track of the probabilities of the different states that, that both players could be in, which in poker means keeping track of the probabilities of the cards of the hands through both players based on where those probabilities come from the policies of the players. Okay. Uh, I, th I think we're actually running out of time. I think there's, there's so, sorry to interrupt. I think there's just like one uh, last quick question that you can maybe ask. Uh, Diana is asking where, where she can find the source code for Rebel. Yeah, maybe you can just type. Uh, that's, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's something, this, if you GitHub, if you search GitHub poker rebel, uh, it will definitely come up. You know, GitHub rebel Facebook, it will come up. All right, cool. So thanks a lot again, Noam, for the very interesting talk. Thanks a lot, Mayho, for the, uh, moderating the discussion. And thanks everyone for participating. Um, so we'll see you in two weeks at the next meetup. Yeah, and also if anybody has any final questions, feel free to email me, I'd be happy to answer. Cool, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank thanks, bye-bye.